You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the narrow mind. Welcome back. All of you narrow mind addicts out there, we're glad that you're with us on this Friday evening, Open Phones Friday. I've been taking some time off from uh, the work schedule. Took a week off from church. I, as a pastor, I get, uh, like I guess like a regular job, I get some time off from work. And so I, I usually get about four weeks during the year. This is the first break that I've taken so far this year. And I'm enjoying it. The problem is I think I'm working harder than I would be otherwise, at, at least physically harder. <laughs> That's for sure. Been doing a lot of work around the house and really getting a lot of things done. And so I've been, uh, you know, I, I built a bar out in the garage and something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Got it all wired up with sound so that you can, it, it, and in fact, we're going to call it the Narrow Mind Pub. I'm going to have my friends over. We've got it wired up with sound so that they can sit out there and listen to the Narrow Mind broadcast. I'm also thinking about um, putting a microphone out there so that I can actually uh, have them give some input from time to time concerning the show. That's what I've been doing this week. And then on top of that, my son and I, uh, if you've been a, a Narrow Mind listener for some time, you might recall that uh, we had restored a Schwinn bicycle. And so we're actually working on two of those this week also. And so we've been busy doing that as well as uh, other things around the house. I got a list, checklist that I'm going off of. So uh, I'm glad to be back in front of this, in front of this microphone. I was, I know that I was getting some emails and some voicemails from some of the narrow mind addicts wondering what was going on and, and they uh, indicated that they were having withdrawals. And so we're back and we're going to resume our regular broadcasting schedule next, next week. So we're glad that you joined us. We're glad that you're with us tonight. We are going to be taking your calls tonight, so uh, you can call us at 1-800-466-1873. That is toll-free, 1-800-466-1873. Or if you'd like to call us on the local line, you can call us at area code 951-676-0583. We'd also like to invite you over to the chat room. If you look at the homepage, if you're not already in the chat room, but if you look at the homepage on the right-hand side, there's a flash presentation over there for Hat Chat. And if you click on that, you can come over and join us in the chat room. And you can actually interact and, and ask questions. If you're too shy to call up, you can ask a question. Or, for example, if you're like Matt from Australia, you live in Australia or some other uh, faraway place that makes it very expensive to call in, you can uh, just type in your, your question or your comment and submit it to a moderator, and they will... Uh, pass it on to me. We've got one question, as I just mentioned, coming from Matt from Australia. Uh, Matt asked the question, I have just finished listening to the Manada Barker debate for the first time, and uh-oh, it's scrolling up. Maybe I need to get somebody to repost it here, because I can't... Uh, those of you that have listened to the program for a while, you probably already know that I have a very um, short attention span, so I don't even know how this is going to work out with, a, with a, the questions being put up on the screen for me. Uh, we're going to try to get it in the future so that my wife will field the questions and then she can just pass them on to me. All right, there we go. I have just finished listening to the Manada-Barker debate for the first time. Dan Barker kept stating that the laws of logic are not entities within themselves which require evidence for existence. I didn't hear a refutation of this assertion by Paul Manada. I understand that the basis of the transcendental argument for God relies on the laws of logic being entities which exist outside of the bounds of physical reality. Dan seemed to be asserting that logic is merely a definition of what the brain does when it uses concepts or language to label that which exists in the sphere of uh, physicality. Could you please explain why this definition of logic is untenable and thus bring it into the arena of entities which require explanation apart from the physical realm. I hope I have articulated myself clearly. Uh, I think you did articulate yourself clearly there, Matt. Um, the problem is maybe you and I are going to be the only two <laughs> that understand the question that you're asking, unless, of course, somebody has listened to um, the Manada-Barker debate. As you mentioned, what Dan Barker was asserting is that logic is just the natural function of the brain. 
And so when a brain, he likened it to the digestion system or digestive system. When you put something in the stomach, it digests, and then um, that's what the brain does. When the brain uses logic, it simply is acting according to its natural function. Um, the problem with that is that that would eliminate the uh, possibility of, say, for example, a contradiction. Because if somebody's brain is just functioning naturally, then how could you say that it's then functioning unnaturally? In other words, how could you have a contradiction? What might be a contradiction to you? You couldn't have any laws. For example, we don't have laws of digestion. And so if he wants to assert that logic is just the normal function of the brain, well, that's fine. He can do that. But he can never complain about somebody being illogical because their brain is just functioning naturally. You follow that? So not only that, but it does, it doesn't account, his worldview doesn't account for concepts, for universal concepts, such as numbers, such as words. And when you, when you're strictly a materialist, which is what he is, you cannot account for these universal concepts that are not material. For example, the number two. We could talk about what it means to be two and you, you don't have a physical two. I mean, the, the number two or two-ness, that's the proper way to say it. Two-ness is something that is a concept, a universal concept. When you have, for example, two glasses of water, you're applying a concept to some physical reality, such as glasses of water. You have the concept, which is immaterial, and then you have the glasses of water. If you remove, if you eliminate the glasses of water, you still have the concept of two, even though you don't have two glasses of water. A materialistic worldview cannot account for universal concepts that are immaterial. So I hope I've answered your question. I want to talk to you about something I said in a sermon last Sunday morning at our church. I was actually preaching, and I was talking about the the natural man's condition. I was talking about how uh, the natural, well, basically how the Bible describes the natural man as being in bondage to sin. And <clears throat> it was, I was explaining in the context of my sermon that this is how we should view unbelievers. In other words, we should view unbelievers, those that are not Christians, as the Bible describes them. Uh, first of all, they are um, they're lost, they're dead, they're spiritually dead. They cannot please God, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 9. In addition to that, um, they have Satan holding them bondage to some degree. They're blinded by Satan. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, that they are held or ensnared by the devil, um, captive to do his will. And the Bible paints all these picture, pictures of the unbeliever that are just dire. On top of that, the Bible says that God is hiding himself from the unbeliever. This is why Jesus talks in parables. This is why um, Jesus says, to you the secrets of the kingdom have been given, but not to them. And so man by nature is at enmity with God. He has natural affections that are contrary to God. He has an enemy that's trying to devour him. And on top of that, he has God who is hiding the truth from him, um, lest he... As it says in, in John chapter 12, lest he see with his eyes, hear with his ears, turn and be healed. And so this, of course, is a, a reformed understanding of Scripture, but it's also a very biblical understanding of Scripture. And so I was talking about the world, how a lot of times as Christians we want to do what the Roman Catholics did. We want to build monasteries. We want to isolate ourselves from the world because we kind of have this dualistic uh, idea of the world. Uh, for example, we're spiritual now, and so we're good. And then the, you know, the material world, everything in the material world is evil. Um, and that's, that's a form of Neoplatonism. It's simply not the case. If that was the case, then Jesus becoming a material person, a human being, throws that whole concept out the window. And so... We want to sometimes isolate ourselves from 
unbelievers. And in doing so, we often do what the Roman Catholics did. You know, they built monasteries. They thought that if they could just get away from uh, the, the sinners, the other sinners in the world, then they would be fine. And they soon realized that the problem wasn't the other sinners. The problem was the sin inside. And the problem was the heart of man. And so as a result, they didn't accomplish anything except for isolating themselves from the very people that God had sanctioned them to reach with the gospel. And so I was talking in the context of my sermon on Sunday about uh, listening to secular music. And whenever you talk about listening to secular music, there are always some Christians who are going to be confused. There are always some Christians that aren't going to understand. A lot of times when we become Christians, we buy into this idea that we... Uh, we need to be a part of this Christian sub- subculture. We have to dress like Christians. We have to only listen to Christian music. We need to only go to Christian movies or G-rated movies. We need to go to Christian coffee houses. We need to have the Christian bumper stickers on our cars. And so we, we what we do is we create this Christian subculture. And when we're talking about the arena of music, what happens is the Christian subculture always tries to duplicate what the world is doing. But the problem is that Christians aren't that good at duplicating what the world is already doing in the area of music. And that's because a lot of musicians, in fact, a lot of good musicians, are simply not Christians. In fact, I would argue that probably the best musicians on the percentage-wise the best musicians that are alive today are not Christians. At least that's been my experience. And although when they when they receive their trophy, they always like to say, thank you, God, or thank you, Jesus, or whatever. But I was never really, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me. And so we, I was talking about how when we create this Christian subculture, we actually isolate ourselves from the people that we're supposed to be reaching. And one of the reasons, and as a new Christian, I didn't think that it was really appropriate for me to listen to non-Christian music. I used to, really, as a, as a brand new Christian, I used to only try to listen to Christian music. And I listened to a lot of sermons and talk shows and things like that. And, um, and that was good for me at that time. But I had this idea that I couldn't listen to non-Christian music. Well, as I grew in my understanding of the Bible, as I grew and I think matured in my faith, as I grew in my understanding of who God was, all of that changed. And part that's part of the reason that I, I play secular bumper music on my radio program. I, I play secular. I play, The music that I play is music that I've selected because I like it. It's The music that I listen to is music that I've selected to listen to, chosen to listen to, because I like it. I don't listen to music just because it's Christian or because it's not Christian. I listen to music because I like it. And sometimes it's going to involve me listening to non-Christian music. So I got some negative feedback on my sermon on Sunday, and I've been kind of thinking about it all week. And I, I think I realized that there is a problem that I may have overlooked in the beginning. And this is the problem. I'm a pastor, and I'm constantly, I'm constantly ministering to people. I'm constantly studying. I'm constantly listening. I'm constant. I'm basically enthralled in the things of God. I do the radio program five days a week. I'm constantly dialoguing with atheists. I'm talking about issues of faith. And when I, from the time that I wake up in the morning, I have what has been described. I think I have what has been described as a God entranced view of the world. I look at the world uh, from the standpoint of the God who created the world. Now, I also, this helps me to, to digest the news because I'm able to digest, for example, the evening news, and I'm able to understand all the evil that's taking place and actually put it in its proper perspective because I realize that we're living in a fallen world. And I not only realize that we're living in a fallen world, but I realize that we're living in a world in which God is sovereign over. 
God is sovereign over every aspect of this creation. And, and I firmly believe that, and I think I could prove that from Scripture. Now, there are a lot of Christians that might give lip service to that, and there are a lot of Christians that um, would acknowledge that, but when it comes down to it, then they don't so readily give God full sovereignty over everything, including evil. And so when I I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, maybe part of the problem, because I received a phone call from somebody who said that I was encouraging our congregation to listen to secular music. Well, first of all, I don't think that I was encouraging our congregation to listen to secular music. I was talking about myself. I listen to secular music. And quite frankly, the secular music that I listen to, I think, is a lot better than a lot of the Christian music that I used to listen to. There is very, there is very few Christian artists that I think do a good job. Uh, most of it, the theology is really bad to begin with, so you might as well be listening to secular music, but that's a whole different subject. So I'm thinking that part of the problem, <laughs> part of the problem that these people have is that they're not looking at the world as God's world. They're not looking at secular music as being under the authority of God. Now, you have to remember that in the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he gives them their commission. So, maybe the problem is, is that people don't know how to listen to music or watch the news or watch movies. And so I thought what I would do is just kind of briefly explain how I listen to music and give you an example of that. Because I'm convinced, first of all, when I listen to secular music, if a person can sing good or they're a good musician, they're able to play an instrument skillfully, um, that is not a, a talent that they have apart from God. In fact, the I would say that God even gifts non-believers, unbelievers. He gifts his enemies. That's part of his kindness. He gives a man, for example, the ability to sing or the ability to play guitar. So when I listen to good secular music, one of the first things I do is observe the giftedness of the musician. All right, so I, I observe the, the giftedness of the musician. This immediately directs my thoughts back to God. And so I am able to, I'm able to really listen and think about God in the context of what I'm listening to. Now, a lot of people don't think that God gives gifts to unbelievers. Well, I'm just going to have to disagree with you. I think he does. In fact, the Bible says that children are a gift from the Lord and unbelievers have children. So that should be the end of that argument altogether. But secondly, all of Hollywood, everything that you turn on the radio, is somehow related to the story of redemption. Men are crying out. Unregenerated men are crying out in pain. And this is a result of a fallen world. So they're crying out. Why, what are they crying out for? Well, they're crying out because they're lost. They're crying out because they have a broken heart. They're crying out because, like the Rolling Stones, they can't get any satisfaction. So I can listen to any song. I don't care what it is. I can listen to any song, and I can begin to see something about redemptive history in that, or the story of redemption, in that music. So, number one, I'm able to glorify God in that I recognize the gifts that are given. They come from God. Number two, I'm able to see the state of the unbeliever. I'm able to see his condition very clearly, which causes me to thank God that I'm not in his condition. I used to be, and it wasn't. if it wasn't for the grace of God, I still would be. And then thirdly, I'm able to be reminded of his mindset, I'm able to really relate to his mindset in such a way that I think that I'm better equipped to understand where he's at. Now, music is just a cultural expression at a particular point in time. And this debate has been going back 
going on all the way back to the Reformation. It's nothing new. I mean, it started with art. Should we only should we only buy Christian paintings, or is it okay for an artist who's not a Christian to paint a picture of a tree, and then me as a non uh, me me as a Christian buy it from a non Christian, hang it in my house? Really, that's that's the root of the argument. Now, the Apostle Paul in and we're gonna Tim. I we got Tim waiting from Fort Worth, and I'm gonna take your call in a minute. So I appreciate your your patience here, Tim. But the Apostle Paul, in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, as he's witnessing in the Areopagus on Mars Hill, he quotes a 4th century B.C. poet. And he says, as even some of your own poets have said. Now, how did Paul know about secular poets or secular poetry? Well, he knew it because he read it. So what was the Apostle Paul doing reading secular poetry? Well, I believe he was trying to gain insight into the mind of the unbeliever. Or it's possible that he could have read it before he was a believer. That's certainly um, a possibility. But the point is this. He uses it, and obviously (laughs) he's very successful with it. He uses his knowledge of secular poetry in his evangelism. That's what Acts chapter 17 is all about. And so he uses it to to show that man is made in the image of God and he uses the, the, the that point of that point of um commonality, the point of contact if you will, that man is made in the in the image of God to use that as a springboard for the rest of his message. Nothing wrong with it at all. And so I'm just going to say this. There is a way. If you have a God entranced view, and this is the, this is how they describe Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards had a God entranced view of the world. He would go out into the world as soon as he walked out of his door, and everything that he saw caused him to reflect on God. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe the problem is, is that Christians aren't doing that. And because they're not doing that, they feel threatened when they listen to something that is not Christian. Now, I don't listen to music for the same reason that I listened to before I was a Christian. I was listening to music before I was a Christian so that I would feel good and so that I would be cool and everything else. So, I listen to it now for different reasons. I enjoy music. It doesn't have to be Christian. But I listen to it because it's part of the world that I live in. And not only that, the gifts, once again, that are given are obviously given from God. And some of these guys are gifted very well. So don't tell me that I can't listen to Elvis sing Blue Suede Shoes. Don't step on my blue suede shoes. I mean, that's a song right there. What kind of redemptive theme is that? Well, <laughs> it's idolatry. I've got a pair of shoes. And I value them so much that I'm singing about you not stepping on them. And so man finds his worth, what? In his possessions. All right, let's go to the phones. Let me give out the phone number, 800-466-1873. Let's go out to Fort Worth and talk to Tim. Tim, welcome to the Narrow Mind. Hey, uh, Gina, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, well, I had a different question, so I don't want your wife thinking I lied to her. Okay. But my original question was what uh, your opinion of New Covenant theology, but I have a better one um, or something to talk about which relates to what you're talking about right now. Um, when I moved to uh, Fort Worth, Texas about two years ago from California, about a year into like kind of church hopping out here, I went to a new church, and uh, they're really young, you know, um, new church, and uh, they said that they were Calvinists, and the pastors themselves did believe in uh, a lot of the Reformed. Um, they were even partial preterists. Or, and, but, you know, and they did expository preaching, but I went one, more, one day on the afternoon. There was like a three-week uh, thing that you have to go through if you want to be a new, uh, like a new member. Right. So me and my wife went. And uh, before it started, we were all sitting around because it was in a house, and uh, about that time is when I first heard about the emergent church. Mm-hmm. So I ask them, you know, this conversation, I go, hey, have you guys heard of this emergent church thing? And they're like, no, no, we haven't heard it. And I go, yeah, I guess it's real wacko. And I kind of sit around and just listen to U2 songs in church, and they all laughed. And 
They said, what, you don't like you too? And I go, no, no, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with listening to you too, but not in church. Mm-hmm. And they were like, well, next week we're doing you uh, two song 40 for worship. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, that's just not, you know, appropriate. You know, right. I'm not saying it's bad about that. And we got in this huge long debate and... Uh, and then later that week, he kept bugging me, and I called the pastor, and we got in a long discussion, and basically his, he used that same verse you were using about Paul quoting the poet, and I kept saying that, look, you know, there's no, I'm not saying it's wrong, because I listen to you too. You know, I listen to, you know, secular music. Even my son listens to you too, you know, but I just don't think it's appropriate for church, and, you know, even you two being a Christian band is even debatable. I know a lot of people are going to get mad at me for saying that, but I've seen some evidence that, you know, they kind of flip-flop a little bit. You know, I just wanted your opinion on, you know, twisting, you know, secular songs to kind of make them Christian and and, and doing it in church. Yeah, Uh, that's a great question. It's a great follow-up question to what I was saying. And I've thought about this. I think that we set apart, the music that we do in church needs to be set apart. And the music that we do in church has a particular purpose. It's uh, supposed to be for the purpose of leading the people of God in worship. And so there are some, I think that we have church history to look back on, and we see the kind of uh, songs that have been sung in church. We also have um, passages in Scripture that says that we're to encourage one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so I would say that what we do in church is different than the way that we would approach an unbeliever. Because, remember, church is not for the purpose. The worship service on Sunday is a worship service. It's not for the purpose of reaching unbelievers, although many churches have turned it into that. The main purpose is not evangelism. It is the worship of God. And so we make a distinction. In our church, we would say that we have music that is set apart for the worship of God. And we would uh, not play uh, songs that were not um, scriptural and songs that were not edifying and glorifying uh, in leading the people of God to worship. And so I'm, I'm talking about something different. Now, the problem is, and you really hit the nail on the head, the problem is is that there's a lot of confusion in the minds of the emergent church. Be- they've gone to the extreme. Now they said, oh, well, we have the freedom to listen to secular music well, let's just bring it into the church. Yeah. And that I strongly disagree with. In fact, I don't even, we wouldn't even allow, we would not even allow unbelievers to participate in worship. So I, I think my personal opinion, I think it's very foolish. And I, I think that there's something in Reformed theology called the regulative, regulative principle. And I think you're kind of hard-pressed to, to prove it from Scripture, but I think it's good in principle. And the regulative principle is that you only worship God as he has prescribed. And so you see patterns of worship in Scripture, and you try to closely follow these patterns of worship in the New Covenant Church. I would be against that idea altogether. Yeah, because another thing, another argument you try to use, and, and, maybe, and I heard that my old pastor in California told me that, no, that's, there's no proof of that, is that Martin Luther wrote Almighty Fortress, and he stole the melody from when he was hanging out in a bar or a pub. Right, but see, it's the words that are important. Yeah. It, it, it's not even necessarily the style of the music. I, and, and this is a whole other um, issue that is very heated and debated. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I wouldn't even argue it's the arrangement of the chords. or I, I think that there are some. I think that there is some music that is more conducive to corporate worship than others. Um, but it, it may be because I'm the product of the culture that I live in. Because if you go over to Africa, for example, they don't their, their worship music is entirely different than ours. You know, there's a lot of drums, there's a lot of dancing, there's a lot of, well, they're singing in another language to begin with. It must be Pentecostal. Well, I'm just kidding. You'd be surprised. Even the Baptists are dancing over there. So uh, it's a different it's a different different cultural dynamic. Here's here's the real issue, though. The words really are the I think the the guideline or the, the 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 test, the litmus test for whether this is a glorifying a, a worship song, and I don't think that you can just take anything and throw it into into the the mix there and say, oh, we're going to use this as a worship song because we like it. No, I think that I think there has to be it has to be scriptural, and that's one of the things that we use in our music. 
are the lyrics scriptural? And I think if they're scriptural, then the melody or the, the chord progression or the beat, all those things become secondary, okay? All right, Tim, good yeah, talking to you. thank you very much. All right, take care. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be taking your phone calls live again at 1-800-466-1873. That's toll-free, 1-800-466-1873. This is Airman First Class Thornsbury. I am an airborne cryptologic linguist stationed in Monterey, California, and when my friends are out on leave and liberty during the weekends, I stay in and listen to the narrow mind. Dang! There's Betty Stevenson, an ex-con and former drug addict, struggling to raise two kids when Mormon missionaries come by. And they came in and told me the most preposterous story I have ever heard in my life. They told me about this white boy, a dead angel, and some gold plates. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what they own. All right, welcome back on this Open Phones Friday. After taking nearly a week off, it's good to be back in front of the microphone. Got my trustworthy wife over there working the phone board. So if you'd like to uh, get in on the, on the show, you can give us a call at 1-800-466-1873. That's toll free, 1-800-466-1873. Uh, by the way, Grace, you may be interested to know that uh, I received some email and people were very supportive concerning your comment about REO Speedwagon. That's because they know good music too and bad music. I think that uh, the evidence or history will show that I have great taste in music. So, no, I didn't even know what REO Speedwagon was. One of our listeners actually sent me a picture of an old truck that I guess that's where the name came from. It's called the REO Speedwagon. <laughs> They're not good. They had a couple of songs, okay? No, they didn't. They had a couple of songs. No. You take the it heard it on, from a friend heard who it from heard it from a friend, a friend who. who. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, Sorry. let's get back to business. And by the way, I got a lot of positive feedback about having you uh, on the show, too. Okay, I appreciate it, okay. everybody. Um, we've got another question in the chat room. So if you uh, if you tune in late, you may not realize this, but we've got a chat room open right now. And if you're too uh, bashful to call or you live on the other side of the world, you're welcome to ask a question in the chat room. You have to submit it to one of the moderators, and they'll forward it on to me. A question for Pastor Gene. Matt asks, are we supposed to listen to gangster rap and be grieved by the depravity? Or are we allowed to listen to it and say, great song, cool beats? Uh, how about both? <laughs> I do both. But I don't like gangster rap, so that's probably not a good example for me. You could put uh, heavy metal or country music in place of gangster rap. I think the question would still apply. And, and I would say both. I would say that you can look at them, you can learn about their depravity. In addition to that, you can appreciate the musical content. And that's just my position. Now, if you don't like gangster rap, then don't listen to it. People, That's one of the questions that come up. Well, what about music with foul language? Well, if that offends you, then don't listen to it. It offends me. I don't particularly like to listen to music that has foul language in it. In fact, I try to make it a habit not to listen to music that has profanity in it. But a movie is a different, a, a whole different thing. I will go to a movie knowing that there's going to be profanity because I think movie, a, a movie is a different a type of medium. It's a different dynamic. So keep that in mind. All right. Somebody asked me a question about uh, the difference between the PCUSA and the PCA. John from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, the difference between the PCUSA, that's Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, and PCA, Presbyterian Church of America, and the difference is that the PCUSA is a liberal denomination. I think the, PS, uh, the PCA may have been started because of the PCUSA going bad, but the PCUSA is a denomination that doesn't um, uphold the authority of Scripture, uh, the inerrancy of Scripture, uh, it is not uncommon to have a homosexual pastor, a lesbian pastor, or woman pastor. So they have they have gone liberal basically. They don't even really teach theology there. Now, you might get one here or there that still you know that has a faithful pastor that's still doing the work of the ministry. 
Uh, but overall, PCUSA is a liberal denomination. There's a question from Brian from Oak Hill, West Virginia. It's kind of weird how the W and the V run together. Oak Hill, West Virginia. He says, I've never met my dad, and as such, I've never had a godly influence on biblical manhood. Where would you encourage men in my position to look for experiential insight on biblical manhood? Well, one of the places I would uh, direct you to would be the local church. I would find a, if you, if you haven't already done so, I would find a local church that has a pastor that has a biblical view of manhood and womanhood. And then I would explain to him uh, your situation, that you were not raised with a father around, that, or at least a father that gave you a godly influence. And then I would also um, direct you to a book by, I think it's by John Piper and Wayne Grudem, if I'm not mistaken. It's called Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, if I'm not mistaken. Biblical, I think it's, I, I can't remember the title. I think it's Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, but that doesn't sound right for some reason. So go there and, and look at the men in the church and try to find men in the church that can disciple you in that area, that are the spiritual heads of their households, that are taking their responsibilities as fathers and husbands seriously, that do have a biblical understanding of what it means to be a man. And I think that'll provide for you a pattern. All right, let me get out the phone number once again. Uh, you can call us on the local line if you like at 951 676 That's 951 676 Or you can call us on the toll-free number at 1-800-466-1873. Speaking of uh, biblical manhood, <laughs> it's funny you ask that question because I... I wrote a post this week. I'm one of the contributors on the Fido blog. Now, if you go over to our website at unchainradio.com, you will see on the left-hand column, there is a, a banner there for Fido. It's got a dog collar. It says Fido in the middle. And I just happen to be one of the contributors to this blog. And I don't write as much as I would like to, but I do write occasionally. And if you scroll down, Um, there is a post that I wrote on May 11th entitled that you might entitled, you might want to wear a protective cup. And I explain in the post, I'll just read it to you. I received an email from a friend of mine who is an elder in a local church in North Carolina. The following excerpt, I can't even say that excerpts are from a paper entitled do unto others, a guide to striking back at the religious right. This article was published by a freaky looking dude named Alroy. Alroy writes in his manifesto, quote, now he's giving instructions. This is an atheist who's giving instructions about how to disrupt Christianity. And this is what he writes. This is, these are his instructions. Go to their churches on Sunday morning. You can find out when the services begin by reading the Saturday newspaper. Take big signs with horrible pictures of people who have committed suicide because of the torment caused by them by the religious right. And wave your signs in their faces. Yell at them. Pick out the nice family with the kids in their Sunday best and get in front of them. Confront these people with the damage their kids will suffer by being raised in such an intolerant institution. Wave your gruesome signs in front of the little old ladies and tell them how their donations are being used to cause such carnage to young women at abortion clinics and to women who wish to get equal pay for equal work and to young gays seeking answers. In your Sunday best, go into their sanctuaries and wait for the service to begin. Plant yourselves in different places interspersed between the regular members. Then, in five or ten minute intervals, take turns standing up and yelling at the preacher and the congregation. Heckle them about their support of oppressive legislation. Shout out against their opposition to equal rights for women. Disrupt their services with arguments against their stance on homosexuality. By spreading out and waiting between outbursts, you can avoid the possibility of all you being escorted out of the building after the first disruption. The church leaders won't be able to pick you out of the crowd until you are already standing and shouting. With enough people, you can effectively disrupt the entire hour-long meeting, making it impossible for church members to ignore your protest. I go on to write. That's the end of the quote. 
I go on to, to write, What will you do if this happens in your church? Let me tell you what would happen if these fellows showed up and started yelling like little girls at our church. First of all, Lawrence, Mark, Matt, or Christian, or some other man, capitalized man, in our church, would grab them from the back and place them in a chokehold. If they resisted, it may be necessary to choke them until they lose consciousness. Then we would drag them out to the sidewalk and warn them to stay away. My advice to any atheist that is contemplating this type of behavior is that you might want to look for a church that has a dove on their logo. Secondly, if you come to one of our churches and try this, then you might want to wear a protective cup. End of post. Now, I took a lot of heat for this, <laughs> and you can just read the comment section and you'll see that. People were saying, look, we should give them coffee. We should offer them donuts. We should be nice to them. We should tell them that we're going to answer their questions after the service. You have to understand, people, these are not, these atheists are not people who are looking for answers. These are atheists that are coming in for one specific purpose. And the purpose is to disrupt the worship of God's people. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody came into my home in front of my family and tried to disrupt my family, we would have an, we would have a problem. It would be, as Jedediah Rambo says, we'd have a little bit of an issue on our hands, okay? Now, think about this. The church is... The church is the family of God. The church is the house of God. These are not people who are coming in seeking answers to their questions. They're coming in because they want to offend, they want to protest, and they want to get in our faces and disrupt the worship of God. I'm saying, as men, we can't tolerate that in our churches. In fact, we need to... I think it would be a great example to our wives and our children of just exactly how a a biblical male a, a, a biblical man response would look like. In other words, a masculine biblical response to a type of problem like this is what it looks like kids. So when you guys are adults and you take the baton from us and you run your churches Make sure you protect the women and the children. I mean, that's Christianity 101. But it seems that we have kind of developed, I suppose we've been influenced by the uh, politically correct way of dealing with problems. And we don't realize that Jesus told his followers, he says, you remember I told you guys to go out and not to take a cloak and not to take um, a money belt and and he says, now I'm telling you to go out and uh, take a couple of cloaks, take a money belt, and take a sword with you. And the word for sword is a small dagger. And then I think it was Peter. He says, here's one, or Here, here's two. And he says, that's enough. All right, so not only did Jesus advocate self-defense, but the law also uh, has uh, within it... Um, circumstances where there are allocations for self-defense. In other words, if you accidentally kill somebody in the process of self-defense, it's not the same as killing somebody otherwise. All right, let's get back to some of the questions. We've got some questions in the chat room. Uh, question for Pastor Gene. I recently started a fellowship with a well-respected Hispanic pastor concerning his mentoring young ministers as myself, but he has some views along the lines of the emerging church. Now, the emerging church is kind of a broad term. Um, it's one of those, it's almost like evangelical. Nobody really knows exactly what it means. I think in the truest definition of the emergent church, the emerging church, whatever, it, it, all it is is a label for, it, it's the new thing on the block is what it is. We We always think that we got to be you know, we we got to we we got to be on the cutting edge of what's happening in the Christian church. So we invent these names, and then we try to change things and adapt to the uh, the culture to the degree that we compromise the message. So a lot of emerging churches are what would be called postmodern. Um, they don't believe in any objective truth. So 
what you need to do is you need to ask your pastor about his view of Scripture. What is your view of Scripture? Do you believe it's the Word of God? Do you believe that it's objectively true? Do you believe that Christ is the only way to the Father? And those who die outside of Christ will be held accountable for their sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? I would, I would just ask him about the essentials of the Christian faith and see what he says about those things. If he doesn't affirm those things, then I would find another church because that's not a church. A church that doesn't believe in objective truth, a church that doesn't believe that Jesus is the only way, a church that doesn't believe that the Bible is the Word of God is not a church. They might look like a church. They might dress like a church. They're not a church. All right, Pastor Alex from New York City. By the way, hello, Pastor Alex. Uh, Pastor Alex from New York City asked a question. I recently started a fellowship with a well Oh, that was. I'm sorry. I got PM that... Uh, that question from one of the admins. I didn't realize that was the same question. All right, Rick is asking the question, what are the means of grace? If so, how many? Now, this is uh, the means of grace, the means of grace. This is uh, Reformed language, and unless you have been a member of a Reformed church for some time, you probably wouldn't even know what that means. But the means of grace, let me just define it for uh, the audience. The means of grace are those things that have been established by God to be an instrument, an instrument for the reception of God's grace. In other words, they're not, they're kind of, um, let me give you an example, the preaching of God's word. God has ordained the preaching of God's word so that he might be gracious to his people. God has ordained prayer so that he might be gracious to his people. God has ordained the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, so that he might be gracious to his people. Now, I don't like to take the means of grace beyond that. There are certain things that God has ordained, established in the New Testament that are meant to be uh, partaken of by Christians, and they actually have an edifying influence and effect in the life of the believer. So I, I try to stick with that as a basic definition. I don't like to go beyond that. Uh, I think that you run the risk of becoming mystical if you go beyond that. And so I like to stick with that. All right, let's, uh, let's see. Now, in case you haven't signed up for the Narrow Mind Update email group, uh, you might want to do that. You can click on the mailbox on the homepage at unchainradio.com. And then when we have a special show, or for, exa- or for example, when I'm on vacation like I was this week, I'll send you out an email, let you know what's going on. If I post a special podcast, I'll send you an email and bring your attention to it. And for example, I preached a message, even though I was on vacation this week, I preached at uh, Bob Morey's church on Monday night at the Faith Defenders headquarters uh, for California Biblical University and Seminary, and I actually posted that sermon that I preached, or it's it's more, it's kind of like a sermon, but it's also a teaching because I did a little bit of a critique on that. But I posted that on the website and uh, I kind of did a critique of natural theology. So if you are not familiar with the uh, the name or the the term natural theology, if you listen to that, you will be very familiar with it. And I think you'll be able to distinguish what's natural theology as opposed to revealed theology. All right, let's go to a question. Uh, Eric from Northridge, California asks, what's your opinion about New Covenant theology? Uh, my opinion uh, is that it's, it's not accurate. It has some good things to offer, but I see, this is my opinion. If you, <laughs> Okay, you've asked my opinion. Let me tell you what my opinion is. My opinion is that New Covenant theology is a hybrid between dispensationalism and covenant theology. That's it. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of covenant theology. It's a little bit of dispensationalism in that uh, it draws a sharp dichotomy between new covenant and old covenant. And um, I, I don't think it's biblical. And we've, we've done some programs on it. I think covenant theology is a much more biblical understanding of Scripture, a, 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 an understanding of Scripture that is more consistent And the main issue with New Covenant theology, for those that might not be aware, is going to be the law. 
what place does the law have in the life of a Christian? Now, because neither of us, neither New Covenant theology or Covenant theology, teaches or believes that one can be justified by keeping the law. And so the question becomes, is there a use of the law, i.e. the Ten Commandments, in the life of the Christian? The New Covenant people that I've talked to and that I've read said there's a new law. It's called the law of Christ. But wait a minute. I thought Christ was God. So how can you have a new law, the law of Christ, if Christ is God? Wasn't the the law of God also the law of Christ? So it just never made sense to me. And then I think you're also going to have a problem with the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. I think you're going to have a serious problem over there. So I'm against it, although I don't have any problem fellowshipping with people who hold to it. I don't have any problem. I mean, if you want to believe in New Covenant theology, I think it's a secondary issue. And I think it's, um, you know, something that as Christians, just like dispensationalism, I have no problem uh, fellowshipping with a dispensationalist. I think it's wrong. I don't think it's biblically accurate, but... Once again, it, it's a secondary issue. All right, I've got a debate coming up on the 2nd of June. It's going to take place in, I think, Moreno Valley on uh, the subject of hell. Is hell a real place? Of, does the Bible teach that hell is a real place of torment? And it's going to go on forever and ever and ever. And so that will be in uh, Moreno Valley. I think it's either in Moreno Valley or Riverside the uh, flyer, the banner is there on the left side of the page. If you click on it, it'll blow it up, and then you can actually read it. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, one more question. Stephen from Ireland says, Thanks for the advice on the liberal theologian I asked you about two weeks ago. I pressed him on how he knows things, and eventually he admitted he couldn't even be sure. Two and two would always be, or he couldn't be sure that two and two would always be equal to four. After he said that, I replied, Well, if you're not even sure of that, why would anyone here even take the slightest heed of anything you've said? He didn't like that. I just sat back down. There you go. If you press them on their epistemology, you're going to find out that they don't have one. So, <laughs> uh, I get distracted easy. I'm over here reading things in the chat room. I really shouldn't be. But uh, we're out of time for tonight's edition of The Narrow Mind. For the month of May, thirty nine ninety nine. You can get an annual subscription, get you into the archive, get you everything in the archive. In addition to that, you get a high-quality podcast feed. Uh, it's not the low-quality one that is free, but you actually get a high-quality one. It's a much higher-quality file, better sound, better quality every, all, the, all the way around. And you'll get a copy of my book. That's it for tonight. If you haven't uh, signed up to become an annual subscriber, time is running out. The month of May is almost over. And then our May special is going to go bye-bye. We'll have another special, but it's not going to be the same as the one now. So let's go ahead and let me see. What would be a good song to play on the way out here? How about this one? All right. You've been listening to Narrow Mind. We'll be back on Monday evening, Lord willing, at 6 p.m. I haven't even decided what we're going to talk about on Monday evening. i got some uh, openings. I'm actually going to try to get uh, a biker guy who started a Christian ministry for bikers. So we'll see if we can get him on the program. But until Monday night, may the Lord continue to bless the study of his word. There's no babies.